Welcome everybody from my side. So my name is Tim Kramer and I'm working here in the IT center since 2010 as a research assistant. And what I want to do today is uh, to present our compute cluster environment. So this contains a little introduction into the hardware as well to the software environment, just to give you an overview of what we have here and how you can use the system. So first of all, brief overview of the hardware again. So Christian already mentioned a lot of these things, so I can do that relatively fast. So this is this cluster, so the bull installation uh, provides 300 teraflops of uh, compute power. So this basically means that in the year where we got the cluster in 2011, this was, uh, this cluster was ranked on place number 32 in the top 500 list of the world fastest computer and at this point in time the machine was uh, ranked on number four in Germany. So it's, it's not a really small installation, it's for a university a quite big installation but of course if you compar compare it with the computers you have uh, in, in the US or in China or in Japan, uh, it's, it's not too big. And of course, this list changes uh, every six months, and now we are still in the top 200, but yeah, slowly getting out of this list. The main power comes from about 1,300 VESMI AP nodes, so these are two socket systems, and each of this uh, CPU has six cores, so we have 12 cores in sum, sum, sum uh, running at 3 GHz. Um, all these nodes are connected with the uh, QDR InfiniBand in a full thread tree. So basically that means that you can use the complete cluster for one single job. If you get the scheduler or the LSF system to schedule a job on the system, which will not be possible, but in theory you could use the complete system. These are about 200 of these 300 teraflops. Another 100 teraflops come from these Nihal MEX nodes. So you see, these are only uh, a little number of nodes. We only have about 80 nodes of us, but these are very big nodes. This is so-called BCS or SMP partition. So in this system, we have 16 Intel Xeon CPUs, so Nihal MEX, and each of these, uh, these CPUs had a had a has eight cores running at 2 gigahertz. And so in sum, we have 128 cores in one single system. And I have a slide later on which describes this a little bit in detail. But these systems are special because basically what we have here is we have two boards connected or two physical boards, four, four socket boards connected to one big system with a special technique from Bull. And we have these uh, nodes in two different memory flavors. So we have smaller nodes with 256 gigabyte of RAM, and we have, I think, two or three systems with two terabyte of main memory. So it's quite a lot. Okay, so this is the real productive cluster, and then we have some smaller parts. For example, the NVIDIA nodes. So we have 28 uh, NVIDIA nodes, and each of these nodes we have two quarter six thousand Fermi GPUs with 448 uh, GPU cores and 6 GB of GPU memory each. So these are in a host system plugged into the PCI Express bus and similar to this technique we have the Intel Xeon Phi also plugged in the uh, PCI Express bus. Intel calls this a coprocessor, not an accelerator for marketing reason, but basically it's, it's the same idea. It's a kind of accelerator in a host system and we have nine of these nodes and in each of these nodes we have 60 Intel Xeon Phi's. There are of course less cores, but you can't, as Christian mentioned before, can't compare these nodes directly because these are real x86 cores. They are slower compared to this Westman node because they have limitations. We will hear on Thursday about that. But this is really x86 uh, cores. And in each of these node nodes, we have about uh, 8 gigabyte of DDR5 memory, so very fast memory, and uh, a relatively high bandwidth on one of these Xeon files. Okay, some words about the storage system. This is also important for many applications, especially for those using big data. 
So we have uh, three petabyte storage in sum. So this is divided into two partitions. First partition is uh, this 1.5 petabyte Lasta file system. So this is a parallel high performance system really designed for high throughput. And you can reach this in our environment with this uh, $HPC work variable. So let's uh, type cd $HPC work and then you can store files on the Lasta file system. But you have a special quota for that. So you can store a lot of memory, one terabyte default quota, but only 50,000 files. So the reason for that is the system is designed for high throughput, but if you store a lot of small files there, then you won't benefit from the, from the performance. So you really should use big files, uh, but, but only a, a small amount of files in the system. Okay, the second partition is uh, a NFS file system. So this is a NetApp filer with 1.5 petabyte as well and you can reach this system with dollar home and dollar work and you have different quotas on these dollar home and work uh, so 150 versus uh, 250 gigabytes and you can store up to 1 million files and the reason is why you get more here is that only the home file system is backup so backup is very expensive you have to write it somewhere and this is why you have a smaller quota here and of course you should use it in a way that all data which is easy reproducible, for example, if you build applications or produce big data which could be easy, easy recalculated, you should store it in work and everything else which is not easy to reproduce, you should store in, in your home directory. Uh, so there's no automatic cleanup for any of the file systems, so we, we don't delete files at the moment, um, so you just can, can keep them there. Okay, this is a, for a slide about uh, the BCS system, uh, what OneNote. And I mentioned before, this is a big system, so SMP partition or BCS. BCS stands for bull currency switch, basically means that the currency is uh, implemented in hardware. And uh, what is really special in this system is that you have two levels of NUMA. So we have 128 cores and we have four sockets. So these are physical sockets built in the cluster. And in one of these sockets you have four Nihalem EX processors. Each of these Nihalem EX processors has its own memory. So what it makes different for programming, and you will see that uh, on, on Wednesday, is really these two levels. So Christian already mentioned that it's important where the data is, because you have a NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. So the memory access is really not, not uniform. What means that? That means if I'm running a core on this Nihal MEX, on this memory here, then you get very fast access because here there's, yeah, this is on the same CPU. It is also possible to access the data which is here from this Nihal MEX processor. That's possible and from the programmer's view you won't see the difference directly but you will see in performance. Because this is the so-called QPI pass, quick pass interconnect, and this is more expensive to access the data, this data from this core, or one of these cores. And if it's, it's also possible to access the data which is in a different board from this core here. This is also possible, but of course this is even more expensive because these sockets or these, these boards are connected with the XQPI fabric and you will get an even higher penalty if you do it in the wrong way. So if you have wrong access or memory access patterns in the system, you won't benefit from the many cores. The performance will really, really bad. Okay, the smallest job granularity is you have to use at least one board in the systems if you submit a batch job. So m basically it means 32, 32 32 threads, and for MPI jobs, um, you only are allowed to use at least one of these systems, so 128 processes. Or of course, you can have a hybrid code, but then you also have to use 128 cores. Okay, this is an overview, you already saw that, and you see all those partitions and also the file system are connected to the same fabric, 
and you see this, this many lines. This is how it looks theoretically. And if you look into the false floor of the machine room, this also looks uh, yeah, very hard to manage, and actually it is. So there are many cables in the false floor um, all connecting all the nodes we have in our cluster. Okay, how to log into the system? So we have we provide different front ends in the cluster where you can log in. So you can't log into all the compute nodes directly. You have to submit a batch job, but to prepare your jobs, red jobs, or to compile or to debug a program or for developing, you can use one of these front ends. So they are for different purposes. So we have some general purpose front ends. This is cluster. Cluster 2 and I would say Cluster Linux is a general purpose um, front ends you can log in and do more or less whatever you do. So it's not allowed to do productive runs there. So you're only allowed to compile and uh, yeah, prepare jobs. Then we have two graphical front ends called Cluster Dash X and Cluster Dash X2. And you can do all, basically everything with 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 a GUI you can start there. For example, you can have a full graphical session with uh, the XVIN32 client, full graphical Linux session, or you can start your Eclipse or uh, MATLAB or whatever uh, you want to start there with a GUI. And then we have some older hardware, cluster Linux Nihalem and cluster Linux Xeon. This is basically some older hardware. If you really want to optimize for one of these hardware types, you can log in there and recompile your code, very optimized only for this architecture with special compiler flags. Then we have cluster Linux Tunic. This is also a special machine where we have a special special version installed of um, one of the Intel tools, which we already introduced uh, in the next days. So this is called Intel VTune. Intel VTune Amplify XE is the correct naming, I think. And we have a special um, module installed here where you can use the hardware performance counter. So you can use Intel VTune everywhere in the cluster nowadays, but with hardware performance counter support only on this special machine. And if you want to access the machine, you have to ask for, for uh, a request for, for access by writing, to the or writing an email to the service desk. Okay, then we have two more special purpose front ends, cluster copy and cluster copy 2. And as you can see in the name, this is intent to copy data. For example, if you from from Ulich or from, from some institute, or even if you want to copy data within the cluster or big, big chunks of data, use this front end because there are better network capabil capabilities. Okay, you can log in with SSH if you come from Linux or you can use PuTTY or whatever graphical front end or XVN32, for example, to have a graphical session if you come from Windows. Okay, I mentioned the batch system, so watch the batch system. Basically, this is a system where you prepare the jobs and ask for compute resources, and then the scheduler of the batch system will start your job on one of the backends. And actually, this is the only way to manage such a big amount of compute nodes, and we have a kind of fair share for all resources of the users, and so this is why you really need or we need this batch system for productive runs, so you cannot run it interactively. Okay, but before I come to the batch system, some words about our module system. So this is now the software part of the cluster. So we have installed many compilers, many different MPI versions, and a lot of ISV software in the cluster. And to handle all these uh, packages, we use the model system, and how can you use this uh, module system? So this is just a module command. You can list what is actually loaded. So per default, we load the Intel compiler and an open MPI into the environment. So this is always there if you log in. These are the preloaded modules. And you can see this with module, oh, you can see what, what else is available with module whale. Then you can, if you see, in module whale, then you see a list printed out on the command line, and then you can load one of these modules, or you can unload a listed module. And if you want to change, for example, um, the compiler version, you have to keep in mind 
that some modules depend on another module. For example, the compiler depends on, or the MPI depends on the compiler version. And if you want, want to switch, so for example, the MPI or also for the compiler, you should always use this module switch and then specify the old and the new model to make a safe or to make a to yeah, generate a clean environment. And if you forget to use the switch, you might want to repair or fix your environment by typing module reload and then these dependencies are fixed as well. If you search for a, a certain uh, certain module, then you can use this model or propos uh, command. Uh, this is also important because these modules, and I will show you in a second, are uh, managed in categories. And you might, for example, if you search for MATLAB, and you don't know where is MATLAB, in which category, you can u search for MATLAB by using mat module apropos MATLAB. OK, so this is what I mentioned. So here's an example. Module avail. Then you see all the modules which are available. But you also see a list of categories. And you only see all the detailed details if this category is all uh, already loaded into the environment. So for example, here we loaded already develop. Then you see the, the modules. For example, open MPI, different versions, GCC, debugger, CUDA, whatever. But you don't see the details, for example, for mask or misc. To see these details, you have to type module load mars and then retype module avail and then you will see the modules which are contained in this mask category. Okay, back to the batch system. So we're using LSF as a batch system. And how can I submit a job? Well that's quite easy. I just have to use this bsub command and then specify whatever I want. For example, yeah. Here should be something like a eight point out. And then you have to specify different parameters. So these are more or less the boring parameters for the job name and where to store the standard out and standard error. And you can specify an email address to get an email when your job started or got, got finished or whatever. Maybe you have a project name where you can submit jobs to. But the more important parameters are for the job limits. So for example, the run limit. So the default runtime is only 15 minutes. So if you want to submit jobs which are longer than 15 minutes, you have to specify it. You have to ask the batch system for that. The same is true for memory limit. So we have a per process process limit, and the default is 512. And if your application needs more memory, you also have to ask in the batch system. So specify a value here. And then, of course, if you do that, you have to keep in mind how much memory do I have on the nodes. And back on the slides, and you have to take care about it. Because if this value is too high, your job will never start. Because we don't have systems available which ha provide enough memory. Yeah, OK. So you a very par important parameter is this dash R, select HPC work. If you're using HPC work in your batch system, please ask for this resource. This is important because the Lustre file system is designed for high throughput. But, well, in the past we saw many malfunctions on the system. And if the system falls down, the Lustre file system, then we only stop jobs submitted to this queue. And all other jobs using not HPC work can run normally. So we don't have to close a complete cluster. We only have to stop all jobs asking for these resources. And this will prevent prevent your job from, from crashing if you use HPC work. OK, you also can ask for node exclusively. Um, please only use this, or use this switch with care. Only use it if you really sure you want to use it exclusively. Because if you have a serial job and you submit it with dash x and the system has like 12 cores, you block other users and you waste resources. So only do it if you're really sure what you what you're doing, and you really need that for some reason. And for bigger parallel jobs, this is set by default anyway. So if you, I think, jobs bigger than, I don't know, like 30 processes, then you will have the system exclusively anyway. 
for the systems. Okay, how to submit a parallel job? So you have to specify how many compute slots do you need. So this, this dash n, as the default is of course one, and you can specify minimum and a maximum proc, but normally this is only one value, so you will get exactly this number of slots. And you have to specify the kind of your job, the parallel job. So is it a shared memory job, for example, OpenMP? Then you have to use this dash A. Or is it an MPI job? Then you have to specify the MPI vendor, MPI vendor as well. So could be dash A OpenMPI or dash A Intel MPI. And then in the batch job itself, you should start your application with this dollar MPI exec dollar flex MPI batch, and then your application. And we really yeah, advise or recommend to uh, use these environment variables and not the native uh, yeah, native executables because we have some tight integration and normally this is uh, what you need and then you don't have care which MPI is loaded. It will automatically set it to the correct MPI exec. Okay. So in order to not write everything on the command line directly, we also recommend to use a job script, for example, job sh. And there you can write everything you want. For example, you go to a working directory, start your application, and you can use this magic cookie, hash bsub. So from the, from the shell's view, this is just a comment, but this, this uh, tag, this hash bsub, uh, is interpreted by LSF. So here we have the job name, the output, the error output, the runtime, the memory limit, and so on. And to, to submit this job, just write bsub, there's a little arrow to the left, and job sh. So this is very important to pipe the script into the executable. Because if you forget this little arrow here, the job will be submitted, but every of these um, magic cookie uh, options will be ignored by the batch system. And you might wonder why is crash my job crashing after 50 minutes? And the reason is, of course, because yeah, you didn't pipe it in. So don't forget this arrow. Okay. For the status of your job, you can use bjobs, and then you will see, okay, is my job still pending or already running? You can specify in different formats. You can also display uh, the reason for a pending job, but actually this is very hard to understand normally. So LSF gives you an advice, why is my job still pending? But sometimes, yeah, it's unreadable. Okay. So if you wonder, oh sorry, if your job is running and you wonder, so in which state is my job or what's doing at the moment, you can use the bpeak command with the job ID, and then you will see the standard output and the standard error in your command line. And then you see, okay, my job is already finished or not, or you have some output in your application and you know, or you might know uh, how long it will take to finish the job or whatever it's doing. And this is also very helpful because if you see an error, because something went wrong, you specified something wrong or the job crashed for whatever reason, then you can kill the job again by using this be kill command and modify your job again and resubmit. Okay, so that's, I think, basically all. So we provide, of course, some documentation. So first documentation is our HPC user's guide. You can find it here on this link. Then we have some new online documentation. So the new link, so the old wiki tool uh, s does not exist anymore. We have now this doc itc rwthachen.de link. But of course, I think there is a redirect and this is a new documentation where you find all the details uh, for the cluster. And not only for the cluster, actually, this is a complete documentation for anything else, for email, for storing, for e anything. Then there are main pages, of course, available for all commands. And in case of errors or problems, just let us know, writing an email to the service desk. Okay, so now we start with the lab session. 